Hello, my name is Talib Küçükcan. I would like to welcome all of you to our program. This is the TRT World Forum Digital Debates. We have been looking at the 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring and the results, uh, impacts and implications. Uh, of course, the Arab Spring has raised a lot of expectations, but also brought about some unexpected consequences. So we will be looking at Yemen today, uh, and especially the humanitarian crisis that's been going on uh, during the conflict. Of course, as I said, Arab Spring has raised a lot of expectations, like the coming of democracy, the, the wealth, uh, civic go good governance, etc. But when we look around the Arab world today, Yes, there are some positive developments, but also there are some crises uh, like Syria uh, and Yemen and Libya as well. And uh, let me uh, welcome Elizabeth and uh, Summer, both of you. Thank you very much for joining us today. And let me introduce you to our uh, audience first so that they can have uh, some idea about your background as well. Uh, Elizabeth Kendall is a senior research fellow in Arabic and Islamic studies at Pembroke College, Oxford University. She studied Arabic uh, actually at uh, the Oxford University a long time ago. Later on, she worked uh, for a number of organizations. Currently, her work examines uh, how militant jihadist movements exploit and feed off traditional local Arab cultures. And of course, she is a prolific writer. She has a number of books uh, written on the subject. Uh, Reclaiming Islamic Tradition was published in 2016. 21st Century Jihad was published in 2015. Literature, Journalism and the Avant-Garde Intersections in Egypt, it was published in 2006. As we can see, she's been working on jihadism, extremism and radicalism, especially in conflict uh, zones. Uh, thank you again, Elizabeth, for joining us today. Now, let me move on to Summer. Uh, she was born in New York and she was uh, also raised there. Uh, uh, she had a bachelor degree, actually, in sociology from Concordia College of New York, and currently she is uh, doing a master's uh, in public administration with a specialization in public policy analysis. Uh, she is a speaker on the Yemeni issues and also analyst on the issues that are related to Yemen. Also, she is uh, chief executive officer at Yemen Aid. That's one of the well-known humanitarian organizations that is doing a lot of uh, good things on, on the ground. And she's been also commentating on BBC, Al Jazeera, and other global uh, networks. Uh, Elizabeth, I would like to start with you. Uh, as we observe, uh, the, the places where there is an ongoing conflict, especially when there is a protracted conflict, we see the emergence of non-state actors. In the case of Yemen, how has ongoing instability and the disastrous humanitarian situation in Yemen contributed to the rise and expansion of groups such as Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Daesh as well? Yes, Dr. Talib, thank you for having me on your show. It's absolutely true that extremism, terrorism thrive in conflict zones and Yemen is no exception. So what we saw when the international aspect of the Yemen war broke in March 2015 was that there was a surge of Al-Qaeda activity in Yemen. It was a massive boost for extremist groups. And as always, there are several unforeseen consequences of war. One of those was that the blockade that the Saudi-led coalition put on the western coast of Yemen meant that the areas in the east of Yemen, that big coastline that Al-Qaeda very quickly became in charge of, benefited because everyone had to get their, their fuel, their food, their goods in through the area that Al-Qaeda controlled. And that meant money, revenue for Al-Qaeda. But I think it's important to understand that it was Al-Qaeda running a state, a proto-state in the East for only one year until coalition forces, mainly the United Arab Emirates, stepped in and squashed it. But we can learn a lot from that one year it was in control. What we learnt, because I analysed all of its governance Twitter feeds, was that Al-Qaeda had 
managed to ingratiate itself to populations by essentially targeting their grievances, addressing all the things that they were worrying about. Uh, and so 56% of its tweets were actually about community development projects. Uh, and that, that was astonishing because what we, of course, notice in the Western media and in Western think tanks and risk advisories are all the gory stuff when you're chopping people's hands off or executing them. And in fact, that's not what they were focusing on. They were focusing on developmental work. They were stepping in to the vacuum left by government. And so just to wrap up, I think often we ask the wrong question. We ask, what is it that makes people join Al-Qaeda or Islamic State? And instead, we should be asking the question, what is it that makes people tolerate them, put up with them in their communities? And, you know, Yemen is used to conflict. It's very well armed. Everyone's got a gun, practically. So it wasn't that they were terrorized. It's that they went along with it because they, they were the best game in town. Uh, of course, it's more complicated than I've summarized here. But, you know, I would welcome your follow up questions. Right. I think my follow-up question will be the following. You said we should ask the right questions, why they join. You know, it is not only in Yemen, but also in Syria and elsewhere. We have seen that not only local people join, but also people from different countries can also join. What is the position uh, of these organizations in Yemen as, well, as, as, as far as uh, people coming from outside Yemen? Because in Syria, we have seen that, you know, there were a lot of people even coming from some of the European countries. What is the uh, uh, situation in Yemen? Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question because actually Yemen is slightly different. Um, before the current war, Al-Qaeda was already active. It was very active, uh, but it was, and it had taken in what we would call foreign fighters to train with it. But it, it's, itself admitted that this hadn't gone down that well. It was difficult for foreign fighters to integrate. Um, and, and we saw this actually when the Islamic State, Daesh, tried to take off in Yemen. It found it really hard. It had an initial surge in 2015, 2014, 2015, but it started quickly to decline. And when I was interviewing communities around Eastern Yemen and trying to compare the impact of Daesh and Al-Qaeda. Often what I came across is that they felt Daesh was foreign, that it was imposed from outside. And frankly, its introductory video, which was published in April 2015, where it planted its flag in the Yemeni sand, uh, it was very uh, glossy and um, punchy and slick and professional but it did not resonate really with Yemenis. It felt foreign. And also the Islamic State coming from abroad, it wasn't tuned in to local culture. It didn't express itself in ways that resonated with local communities. And it was brutal. It, it was unambiguously bloodthirsty. Whereas Al Qaeda, for example, when it ran its state, it expressly issued orders to say no up close blood and guts photos, when they did do stonings or executions, they cordoned off uh, a large arena, they wouldn't allow close-up photography, and they always made it look statesmanlike. They had an ambulance or a police car on hand, and they vowed not to do massive public bombings of mosques and to target women and children, they made a big deal of that. Now, of course, they didn't always get it right. And they had to apologize for various attacks, such as one on a hospital uh, and another beheading of 14 soldiers in Hadramaut. But they said this was rogue groups. This wasn't us. So to sum up, Al-Qaeda had the upper hand in Yemen because it was local, because it was locally tuned. And Daesh started to dwindle because it was not, because it was largely foreign and it was more more brutal. Well, thank you very much to, uh, I think, uh, provide such a, uh, a ground for our uh, discussion. Now, let me turn to uh, Summer. Uh, 
you have been involved in humanitarian uh, work on the ground as well, as far as I can see. You know, what is the most challenging aspect of humanitarian crisis in Yemen? Also, can you compare before the pandemic and after the pandemic? Because after the pandemic, I think things have gone out of control in many places, especially when there's a war and conflict. What is the picture in Yemen and uh, what are the main challenges? Sure. Thanks so much, Dr. Taleb, for the opportunity to, to speak about Yemen and, and the humanitarian crisis, among other uh, among other notes um, during this program. Obviously, um, you know, it's been seven years, roughly, uh, when this war had started, um, and it started locally, and then um, interventions came along um, along the way later on. Uh, but to sum up, really, after seven seven years, Yemen's humanitarian crisis truly has been catastrophic. It's actually to to date the worst um, the worst type of uh, humanitarian crisis around the world. Uh, but this is due to two reasons, from from my understanding and, and my readings and um, all the work that we do. It's first, obviously, instability. So conflict kind of creates this vacuum of, of uh, humanitarian crises, but also the economic downfall. I mean, these are these are two essential uh, attributions to Yemen's humanitarian crisis. Uh, currently, there are about four million IDPs. Um, they're actually internally displaced. So these are communities that continue to move from city to city, depending on where conflict is and where fresh combat uh, starts. Um, they are really around spread between the the city of Ma'rib, the province of Ma'rib, and freed provinces, specifically um, in the south of Yemen. Um, of 30 million people, about 70% of Yemenis need humanitarian assistance. Now, I guess one of the uh, biggest challenges right now for communities uh, on the ground is domestic travel. I mean, this is one of the biggest problems that we've seen uh, that created just large issues and um pouches of famine and uh, and issues when it comes to water access and schooling. And uh, unfortunately, this has created also issues with um, patients causing delay to, to in transporting um, themselves to ERs or hospitals. This is also impacting transportation of goods, uh, which obviously impacts the transportation costs of these goods. And at the end of the day, that, that burden hits the citizen. Um, and so we've seen this case, these cases specifically even in the province of Taiz, which is um, one of the, the most heavily populated provinces in central Yemen. Um, and currently there is a siege on that province. Um, in regards to COVID, so just to give a back end, uh, the health sector in Yemen was not, was not that um, it was not that great um, even before the war. But what the war has done is that it totally uh, almost collapsed collapsed it. Um, I really believe, and I think some people would argue with me on this, but I really think it's almost non-existent. I mean, given the visits that I've had on the ground, I can tell you that basic items are, are needed, like blood bags, uh, PPE items. We're talking about patients being you know, tested on the floors of hospitals. I mean, it's just a horrendous, horrendous situation where even um, emergency rooms are using are using tools during the Soviet Union. I mean, these are just unbelievable, um, unprecedented problems. Um, again, patients can't travel to hospitals. The salaries are not enough to sustain them to even use transportation for transportation costs. It's a really detrimental situation. For COVID-19, um, you know, COVID-19 obviously added more stress on an already overwhelmed health sector. Um, from an international perspective for NGOs like ours, we saw, uh, uh, two big issues. The the first is obviously we we had difficulty um, uh, wiring aid to and monetary aid to to uh, to Yemen. This is because of the world banking system at the time, especially during the first few months. We found um, some issues with that, uh, and then also the ship uh, shipping lines. When it comes to shipping aid, uh, medical equipment, medical supplies, that was also halted. So this obviously uh, evidently impacted the work that we do and others, I'm sure, uh, for the first uh, few months during the COVID-19 pandemic. So at this time in, in Yemen, there are around 6,800 cases, active cases at least, um, of COVID. Uh, there's around 3,600 recoveries, roughly about 
1,300 deaths. And, you know, I'm going to be honest with you, take these data points with a grain of salt. Uh, the only reason why these numbers are not uh, accurate is because we don't have the we don't have the resources on the ground, including testing kits, labs, um, even ventilators uh, at all to kind of you know, place these individuals into these hospitals and actually do a real count. Um, also, we're dealing with facilities on the ground that are either run uh, by an already fractured, uh, you know, health sector through the Ministry of Health with limited uh, financial capabilities, but also the INGOs, which have um, been cut off in, in the majority, at least through funding. Uh, and so this, some of these hospitals and these centers are not fu functional or operational anymore. But just like any health crisis, um, policies and regulations and governance matters. Um, and so policies and laws save lives. But in Yemen, we didn't see that. We didn't see local authority uh, doing the work that they're supposed to when it comes to implementing social distancing regulations and such. Last point in regards to COVID, um, COVAX, which is a unified entity for you know world or or organizations and world countries where they support uh, you know, countries like Yemen and other underdeveloped nations with uh, vaccines. And so we've received the first batch um, of COVID vaccines of 2 million vaccines. Uh, so far about 60,000 vaccines have been given to Yemenis, which is astonishing given the um, uh, the current, uh, you know, cultural climate when it comes to vaccines and the, you know, the myths around that. Um, and unfortunately though, in uh, the capital, uh, I'm sorry, not the capital, in, in Yemen, uh, specifically in Sana'a, um, Houthis have, have been very problematic in regards to COVID vaccines. They refuse to take them um, due to some issues with supervision uh, with the WHO. Um, they only received about 1,000 so far vaccines um, from 10,000 promised. Um, and so there are very, very, you know, obviously politics impacts uh, humanitarian work. And so th this is uh, pretty much the, the the COVID scene from from far. Well, huge challenges as we can see. On the one hand, we have got you know, these health issues. On the other hand, we have got this you know radical uh, I think uh, groups. Now, uh, uh, Elizabeth, you have been working in an advisory capacity to a cross tribal body in Eastern Yemen that promotes social and political cohesion. Uh, you know, but when you look at Al Qaeda and Daesh uh, and all these, you know, uh, groups, to what extent this initiative uh, works? What are the successes and failures, or the shortcomings of the initiative that you are advisors you are advising? Yes, thank you for asking that. I, I do have the privilege of working with a cross-tribal body uh, who currently now works through an NGO uh, and many of the problems that Summer has outlined resonate here. You know, what, what community leaders wanted to do in the east of Yemen, and I'd been going in and out for years, I, I still am actually, um, since bef well before the war. And, and so I'd built up some relationships and what they wanted to do was to try to get into communities to build them up before the extremists could get there. Because as I noted earlier in the programme, of course, extremism slips into the vacuum that's left by central government and, and starts to figure out how to fix local grievances. Actually, I can give you a one small anecdote. When I was interviewing community leaders from Mukalla in Yemen at the height of the Al-Qaeda state in November 2015, uh, it was really difficult to, to get to meet them and there were loads of checkpoints. And, and what they said to me was they were complaining about having Al-Qaeda limit their personal freedoms, rule their cities. And, and there was a whole litany of complaints. And so it was by this time getting late into the night, I said, could we continue this discussion tomorrow? And they said, oh, no, 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 Doctora, because we have a meeting with Al-Qaeda tomorrow to figure out a water problem to fix a land issue, to, to give me some uh, business for my cement factory. So that just tells you how the collaboration can work if communities don't seize the initiative and try to get regional government to help them. So in terms of the challenges, well, there have been 
so many, but but let me just highlight uh, maybe two or three. One is is lethargy. Um, it's 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 hard to make people think that anything they do is going to make a difference because they're so used to being marginalised and underinvested in. Actually, in a survey that I I conducted in the east of Yemen, I asked uh, over two thousand tribesmen and tribeswomen, do you think the revolution was a good thing or a bad thing or not important at all? And 16% only thought it was a good thing. And not many more thought it was a bad thing. 18% thought it was a bad thing. The vast majority had, you know, just thought it made no difference and wouldn't affect them. And so you have to counter this lethargy. And, and the other challenge is that this, this is fueled by patronage from Gulf countries. I mean, handouts, money, gifts from Gulf countries that skew the economy and disincentivize local initiatives. And then there's also the problem of, you know, convincing people that joining an initiative like a fishing cooperative or uh, producing honey is a, is a good option when you can just immediately earn between one and two thousand dollars by joining a militia. So it has been challenging, but perhaps I'll just give you a couple of successes since, since you asked. There have been some successes, and one would be, one of my favorites is the, the way local leaders instituted an annual, yearly, inter-tribal camel race in the empty quarter. And this was great because it brought together loads of disparate tribes and communities, quite outlying, vulnerable, along the smuggling routes, and, and, and helped to build their relationships together. And, and that still goes on, although it was cancelled for COVID last year. And, and another one was a, a massive environmental cleanup of 560 kilometres of coastline with over 500 volunteers. This is all really cheap stuff. Um, we engaged 17 mosques who, who helped organize it. And, and that was amazingly useful because I had noticed in my own research that Al-Qaeda, 16% of its tweets were about community cleanups. So why not get people to own their environment without help from extremists? And then also involving women. There are several initiatives that local communities have done and women's empowerment, uh, workshops to try to give them a voice in decision-making in the local community. Research shows that when women are involved in planning the future and have a voice in, in peace deals, that they stick for longer than if they're not involved. And, and the women have also launched their own newspaper, which, which is fascinating. And they run all sorts of articles with local ro role models um, to promote literacy. But finally, I think the most important thing is to get youth on side and to engage them in the future of their country. Because, you know, right now, over 2 million Yemeni kids are out of school and the schools that do exist are not that good. So we've started a program called Enna Wanahnu, you know, Me and Us, which helps, to, helps kids to link actions to consequences and helps them to take responsibility and to plan their future and to motivate them to to have ideas and to pursue them rather than just sit and wait for it to happen. And, and this is going great guns. People absolutely love it. And I should just say to finish off that these are not my ideas. These are, this is me helping people implement their ideas. That's quite important. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, that brings us to the issue of uh, international intervention. Uh, Elizabeth, you have uh, indirectly alluded, I think, the uh, help coming from different countries. Uh, now, Summer, you've been involved in the humanitarian work, but also I think you are uh, observing the discussions and debates around, uh, uh, about the international intervention and the legitimacy. Uh, Iran is intervening very directly. Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates okay. also, they were part of the game, I would say. How this is perceived by the people uh, of Yemen on the ground? Yeah, this is a very complex question and I think it deserves a, a debate by itself. Um, so let, let's just, I mean, just for the sake of audience purposes, we're gonna just break down these groups and, and what they represent. And then um, I'll try to kind of give a, a glimpse of it, not like a you know sociological analysis of anything. Uh, but first, 
you know, let's talk about an uh, order as what you said, Houthis, um, when it comes to Iran and their and their interventions and support. So obviously Houthis have been supported by Iran, continue to be supported by Iran. Um, and what Iran does is very sophisticated. It's it's very simple, not even sophisticated, but it's very simple. They they support Houthis um, logistically, financially, even with weapons. They, they're 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 smart enough to know that they cannot send large weapons um, to Houthis, but what they do is they send smaller ones. And then that accumulates over time um, and creates obviously some instabilities, but also some tactical and strategical support, which their drones have been um, have been improving uh, against, you know, obviously uh, Yemen, but also uh, to Saudi Arabia and their attacks on, on the kingdom. Um, that's that's the first. And they, they are essentially, the, the, the ones that really essentially started the, the conflict with their coup against the state and the institutions in 2014. In regards to the Southern Transitional Council, um, this is um, an interesting, it's an interesting uh, concept. I think um, at the end of the day, the STC is supported obviously by the United Arab Emirates, um, uh, but they were, they are, they are somewhat, um, rec they recognize the the coalition, they recognize the government. They are now um, in line with within the government and recognize them as officials. And through that the Riyadh agreement from Saudi Arabia, they are now part of the government. Um, and then lastly, the legitimacy. Um, it's really the only representative when you when it comes to uh, the representation of Yemen state and its institutions. And they also include political parties that adhere to the Yemeni constitution. Um, so at this time, if you look at it from a, from a bird's eye view, really all these different groups um, align to the government and the coalition somewhat, um, but the only group that it's not aligning is the Houthis. Now, there are different views, obviously, by Yemenis regarding these interventions. Um, but this is because of the nature of the war, from my uh, from my view. Uh, for example, in free states, uh, there is vast support for the Saudi, Saudi coalition, um, given their support to liberate the area from Houthis. And this is a n natural and normal um, result. In areas under uh, heavy control by Houthis, there are mixed views by average citizens. So there are some who support the coalition. And then there are others who do not, given that they've only seen airstrikes on, on their, you know, on, on Sana'a and other areas. And so, however, though, I really want to point out is that there are, um, the average citizen, though, does not support Houthis in their areas. The, unfortunately, citizens cannot express themselves in those areas and they can express their opinions. Uh, and then unfortunately, there are thousands who are tortured, abused um, because they, they do speak out. Um, and so, you know, and then lastly, as for the UAE and their support for the STC, there are some support by Southerners for this, uh, for this group. And then there are non-supporters. So uh, the farther you go east to Yemen, um, in the south, the, the less you'll find support for the STC. And just to clarify, the STC uh, currently is you know inclusive to the um, to the security forces on the ground, specifically in Aden and Lahaj, and these are really and some of maybe Abyan, but these are really the only two provinces that they're uh, that they are pretty much physically um, you know present um, at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, the the views are, are important, but it shows you that the country is very complex and very opinionated. And Yemen is, is obviously a part of rich history and great identities. And so th these these d disagreements and these divisions are part of just as, uh, you know, Elizabeth had, had mentioned that there is there's a gap. And when that governance gap is is visible, um, this is where in social social fragmentation happens. Right. I think uh, all we agree that Yemen is a complex country uh, from a sociological and for, from a political and also from a historical uh, point of view. While talking about, uh, you know, intervention of other countries, uh, Elizabeth, how have groups such as uh, Al-Qaeda and Daesh exploited the Houthis, Iranian links to advance their uh, projects in the country? Yes. How have they exploited the Houthis' Iranian links? Well, I, I mean, I should just first of all say that the nature of what Al-Qaeda and Daesh are has changed over the course of the war. So it's not just a question of the terrorist groups exploiting um, 
the Houthis links with Iran, but also the Houthis exploiting the terrorist groups. Um, perhaps we can get into that later. But at, at the most basic level, of course, the Houthis links to Iran are part of a narrative which feeds sectarian rivalries and fears. And so what in Yemen began as a domestic conflict over how to share power, territory and resources has become more of a religious battle, uh, an almost apocalyptic Sunni versus Shi'i battle, which at least at the beginning, these terrorist groups really fed off. And, and that was helped by the kind of sectarian narratives coming out of the Gulf countries themselves in the Saudi-led coalition, and also helped by the Houthis who have become increasingly dependent on Iran and who's, who have become increasingly culturally close to Iran. Uh, the, the Houthi leader now speaks as though he's speaking the word of God. And, and, they, and they are essentially now a supremacist movement. So, you know, at the start of the war, when Al-Qaeda sprang to life, they were able to recruit Southerners who were essentially worried about Northerners and Northern encroachment and turn that into a recruitment mechanism for their own holy war I was speaking to locals at the time, early in the war, and they told me that about 13 ships had been mobilized by Al-Qaeda, sort of Dows, et cetera. They'd recruited locals, taken them off to Aden to fight the Houthis. And by the time they all came back six months later, they were ideologically sold. So the war has really helped to promote sectarianism. Nonetheless, Although the labels are still there, Al-Qaeda and Islamic State, I, I think we need to recognize that the, those groups themselves have changed and evolved and they've become political tools, not just religious ideological outfits. I think that's a very dangerous uh, and development, instrumentalization of religion or sectarian identities in such, uh, let's say, volatile uh, and divisive uh, uh, regions. Now, Summer, as uh, Elizabeth explained, uh, there is a lot of friction on the ground. There is war going on, and the international community also is divided about the future of Yemen, especially when we talk about states that are intervening at the moment, Iran and the, and the Gulf countries. Under such conditions, how do you think you can help people on the ground, whether you can really take uh, humanitarian aid to the country? What are the main obstacles? Whether there's a deliberate, let's say, uh, hindrances by different parties. And also, as uh, uh, Elizabeth said, I think the role of women uh, is critical. And what is the role of women in these humanitarian uh, campaigns and uh, uh, aid delivery in, the, uh, in Yemen? Sure, this is a, a, a great question. And I think, um, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges right now is that there is no accountability um, by uh, by those on the ground and by those even from the international community, and that includes international NGOs, um, to be honest and frank. The humanitarian access has been problematic for local NGOs. They have been unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, there really are hundreds of violations every month on a, you know, on a monthly basis in Yemen. And, um, when we look at the numbers, uh, the majority, unfortunately, are in areas that um, are heavily populated, which is under healthy control. So you'll find um, you'll find the majority issues such as women being stopped, um, even though they work with uh, non-government organizations and humanitarian or organizations, but they get stopped at checkpoints because, again, there is a religious um, concept of that they cannot travel without, uh, you know, um, a, a family member who is male or what you call mah mahram. Um, and then there are times where even just different parties um, on the ground when it comes to agreements end up backing out even after an agreement has been has been signed. Uh, there are issues of intervention and the sovereignty in those decision makings. So for example, in, uh, in Sana'a, they have a, like a, a system in place to 
kind of uh, make sure to supervise all these NGOs. And unfortunately, they, they you know, prioritize locations, beneficiaries, who, what, where, even though it may be supporting military, it may be supporting battlefronts. And these are things that you cannot, as an organization, support. Um, so that's that's one of the biggest issues in, in the government um, areas. There are issues of, of uh, detain, uh, being detained, uh, but later on, we do find that they are released. Um, and again, it's just because of the, the governance, um, the gap in governance, you have different pockets of groups that are heavily armed and they, they assume that they are in power, although they have no legal, legal aspect to that. But I think um, another thing is that there is a slow process in license approvals, and this is something that delays uh, interventions. And so when we talk about the political peace process, um, we find that there is also, um, there really is, a, in, I would say we're, humanitarian organizations are being ignored or left aside um, even when it comes to peace processes but unfortunately we are the ones at the end of the day that handle all these issues um, and whatever happens politically on international it always hits to uh, to the ground so i think if we focus on accountability and there's a mechanism in place to respect international humanitarian law then uh, then we can find solutions to to the to the current situation. But even if there is a peace process and there is some some you know light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to that, um, if there's no respect by all those all those on the ground, then then we still would have a problem. Okay, now who will enforce the international humanitarian law on the ground? I mean, do you have any suggestions or expectations for a main organization? Sure. So I think obviously the first is the government of Yemen has to kind of continue to push that um, message throughout their meetings with uh, international organization. There are systems and clusters in place on the ground. These are run by the United Nations, UN OCHA. And so they need to, um, you know, unfortunately, you have to be sensitive about, you know, when to implement where and who to blame. And so unfortunately, the last few years, we've seen that there are attacks on violations, but kept quiet because we don't want they don't want to disturb other um, uh, other interventions. However, I think that there should be an independent group that is not connected to anyone to implement those mechanisms. And then lastly, the NGOs and CSOs on the ground civil society organization have the responsibility and duty to speak up. Although I don't blame them if they don't do to security reasons. Uh, but if there is a some sense of task force to say, you know what, this is enough um, we need to kind of work together even though we may not agree on many things but at the end of the day the support is for beneficiaries then it needs to be done right okay uh, elizabeth uh, we talked about instrumentalization of uh, religion and sectarian identities we are not living in the middle ages where religion was a source of conflict and war today of course when we look at yemen and in other places it seems that religion uh, is not the cause of the uh, conflict. There are some maybe uh, interest groups, uh, uh, etc., or international forces. But then when the conflicts goes on, we see that religion uh, and the sectarian identities become part of the game, I would say. Here in the case of Yemen, it's reported that United Arab Emirates has forged links with Uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula to further its interests. What would be the long-term impact? Maybe in the, in the, lo in the short term, it may be uh, you know, something that would contribute to the uh, United Arab Emirates' interests. But in the long term, because this uh, divide, you know, division on the basis of religion and ethnicity and also uh, sectarian identities is deeply held and it will never go away, uh, you know, Uh, in the in the short term, what will be the long term conflict for Yemen, also for the countries that are involved in this uh, issue? Well, this is an incredibly important question, and yes, there have been credible reports of the United Arab Emirates forging links with Al Qaeda, as there have been credible reports of other actors in the war doing the same with either Al Qaeda or with uh, Daesh. But there are you know, different ways of reading this. I mean, there is a difference between peeling away Al-Qaeda elements by offering them incentives or alternatives and between paying them to actually continue being Al-Qaeda. So, you know, one has to be a bit careful of the sensationalist media headlines. It's not always as quite as straightforward as it seems. 
But, you know, I think this question, as you put it, you know, there's this complex tapestry where the political is wrapped up with the religious and, and where these groups get used at tools is really important. Um, you know, some of these extremist groups have now been absorbed into more mainstream militias, probably on more than one side in the war. And what we saw emerge a little bit more as religious warriors at the beginning of the war um, have now turned into to guns for hire, almost mercenaries. And we've seen terrorist extremist groups become much more aligned with organized crime. Uh, and that might, may also be a, a reverse function of having droned so many of their leaders. Uh, there's not so much spiritual guidance now. But the question that you asked right at the end there, you know, where is this going? This is key because, all right, it might seem as though Al-Qaeda and Daesh have been degraded. They have been degraded. We're at about one in 10, the rate of operations in, domestically in Yemen that we were at the peak of its guerrilla operations in 2017. So definitely degraded. Um, and they've fragmented and they've splintered and they're probably not even clear themselves who's, who's who. But the worry is what is going to happen to all of these militias when the war ends? What's going to happen to all of the fighters that have been recruited across the South that are not part of the mainstream Yemeni military? What is going to happen when a peace deal is finally achieved and there are lots of groups inside Yemen that don't feel represented, that feel marginalized, that feel that it was just an elitist exercise, it doesn't count for them. This is going to be the moment for extremism to take off again. Al-Qaeda and Daesh might come, might come straight back onto the scene and take advantage. So ironically, peace is possibly the most dangerous moment because all of the key ingredients that, that motivate militant jihad groups are still there. It will still be uh, an awkward state sectarianism will still be rife. Armed militias have proliferated but might be demobilized. Foreign proxies will still be trying to wield influence on the ground. And there'll be an entire generation of uneducated youth, millions of people who have been displaced and their eco economic circumstances ruined. All of this will still be there. It's not going to be healed overnight. So definitely one to watch. Well, I think the headline from what you have said is peace is a dangerous moment uh, because of the, uh, I think, uh, risks that are involved there. Here, uh, I would like to move on to Summer uh, as my last question to you. Now we are talking about the peace, whether there are conditions that would lead to peace in Yemen. And if there are, uh, if there is going to be a peace, uh, do we agree with Elizabeth that, you know, all the, the forces will unleash the radicalism, extremism, and all the other, uh, you know, forces that will be detrimental to the Yemeni uh, state and society. Right. I think um, Elizabeth had pointed out some excellent points when it comes to peace. Um, this is a word that's been flourished and romanticized too much um, when it comes to Yemen's conflict. The first is that you're dealing with different groups, different identities, different religious, you know, views, different supremacists. And so it, it's, it's a very toxic situation. Um, the first, I think, is that everybody, at least from, from the government side and, and, and from other non-state actors, um, excluding really Houthis at this rate, are, are in need of peace. Um, they, that, that's what they're pushing for. That's the international consensus at this time. There's massive movement going on, including with the, um, uh, the United States um, U.S. envoy to, to Yemen, Tim Linder King. I mean, there's a huge diplomatic push for it to happen. Because once there's a ceasefire in place, then there may be some other types of dominoes that can fall into place to, to get some sense of uh, normalcy back into Yemen society, which is the humanitarian situation, opening up and easing transportation and, and, and um, ports and such. However, though, um, you know, Elizabeth pointed out something really, really important. 
that every group has its own views um, and are they going to be are they going to be included in the next step? And I think this is where the National Dialogue Conference comes out and the outcomes of that is that Yemen is now facing a, a, a crisis, but I think it's also leading to a, to a federalist state. So federalism is, is really key here moving forward. Um, right now we need institutional me mechanisms in place to kind of bring everybody together that yes, you can stay in your places, we'll have central banking systems in place, we'll kind of reorganize what we've lost um, and how to kind of move forward for that. But again, with religious ideologies, and supremacist views and understandings. The only thing that can help Yemen with that is accountability. You cannot, uh, mili you cannot fight militarily, at least the ideology, it's always going to be there. You have to fix the economy to get back those soldiers that were are, are now displaced because they can't just find jobs. And if that is in place, then I think there is positive chances that things will get better, but not like, like as Elizabeth said, not today maybe in the next few years in time. Well, thank you very much. Elizabeth Kendall, a Senior Research Fellow in Arabic and Islamic Studies at Pembroke College at Oxford University, and Samer Nasser, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Yemen Aid. Thank you very much for joining us at the DRT World Forum Digital Debates on Yemen. Thank you very much, and I hope to uh, see you and host you in other uh, venues and uh, meetings. And I also would like to say goodbye to our audience uh, from this session. All the best to you. Goodbye. Thank you.